and I, th I think I can, I think I can say that uh, Michael uh, knows more about agricultural law than anybody uh, anybody else I know, and I think uh, uh, his expertise is pretty well known internationally. So we're very lucky uh, to have him with us, and so he's going to speak on agricultural land management schemes, regulatory implications post-Brexit. Uh, we're hoping he'll also uh, have some time also to talk about trade uh, issues as well. Um, so Michael, um, I'll give you the floor in just a few seconds, uh, but you have um, well, 20 minutes uh, and uh, that should hopefully leave us uh, some time for some, uh, some good discussion uh, afterwards. So over to you, Michael. Hello, well, thank you very much, Greg, for that extremely generous introduction. And what we're going to, to look at uh, uh, today is some legal implications of the new environmental uh, land management schemes. There has been some sterling and excellent work taking place with ecologists and uh, economists, and, but there's also a legal dimension to this. And have been fortunate in, in working on uh, two projects at Leeds uh, with colleagues in earth and environment and in geography and details of those projects are uh, available uh, on the slide at the end of the, the, uh, the uh, talk. What I thought we'd do is uh, look at two particular aspects in, in terms of outline. We'll um, look at the tenancy implications having just had a canter through the, the outline of the scheme, and then we'll have a look at world trade implications. Now, when the talk was advertised, I also said we'd have a look at results-based schemes. Now, I'm very happy to take questions on that afterwards, and, uh, and there's something, again, I've been working on. But uh, I think in, in, in the interest of time, I think we'd be a bit squashed in trying to cover that in 20 minutes. So just on to the next slide, please. Um, if we then, um, as I say, have these two, two elements, the um, challenges to tenants and then the WTO implications, and a good advert for a John Deere tractor in, in the bottom right-hand corner. So moving on then to the environmental land management scheme, what it is, it was clear right from the start with health and harmony, uh, the, the the policy document that got all of Elms on the road, that it was going to be the cornerstone of agricultural policy. And since Health and Harmony, it's now uh, clear that it's got three different components. There was talk of tiers earlier, but we're now on to components. There's a sustainable farming incentive, the SFI, local nature recovery, and landscape recovery. Now, one thing to highlight that this scheme is for England only and that different regimes are being put in place at various uh, levels of uh, speed uh, in, in the other devolved administrations. So on, on to the next slide again, we've got the um, looking at the SFI, uh, we've got that pays farmers for actions, which they manage uh, their land in an environmentally sustainable way. That's it's seeding a, a baseline, a regulatory baseline. They've got to go above what the law requires them to do anyway. And perhaps one way of looking at it is some form of extra effort is required of farmers to unlock payment. Whereas, although there was uh, some rules to comply with in the case of the old uh, direct payment schemes under the CAP, uh, the basic payment scheme as it, its last iteration, those were not considered too high a hurdle. Whereas here, it might be a, a, the hurdle, the bar may be set higher before the Treasury is going to open its coffers. The second component is local nature recovery, and that pays for actions to support, as advertised, local nature recovery. And I think a key element of this is the focus on collaboration. Uh, it's something that, again, Leeds has been quite heavily involved with. Uh, the Countryside Stewardship Facilitation Fund is an earlier uh, example of fostering cooperation between farmers, that's definitely something they're moving forward. And particularly thinking of adopting landscape scale uh, approach in the third tier, 
which is landscape recovery. And that's going to support the delivery of landscape and ecosystem recovery through long term land use change policies. So, for example, you'd have ex, uh, large amounts of tree planting, uh, you'd have uh, particularly peatland restoration, which is relevant to Leeds. Now, in terms of time scale, the core elements, not all of it, core elements of the SFI have been rolled out in 2022 this year with full rollout of all three components by 2024. Now, this isn't a, um, a legal point necessarily, more economics, but one thing to note is that they already in 2021, last year, started cutting existing direct payments. And by 2024, the point when the new schemes are fully rolled out, those who are receiving payments, well, the bits of uh, of, of, uh, of, of payment over £150,000, that will only be your largest farms, but they will already be subject to a 70% uh, reduction. So in terms of economics, before we move on to law, it's fair to say there's a bit of a squeeze on the finances in that the direct payments are going, existing ones, but the new ones aren't yet readily accessible. So moving on then to uh, challenges for tenants, the first one we're going to look at is the mismatch between length of tenancies and length of uh, uh, environmental land management schemes. As I think you are aware, new tenancies, uh, they're going to largely be farm business tenancies, mainly governed by freedom of contract. And the, uh, the average length of new farm business tenancies in 2020 was 3.4 years. So nothing like your old agricultural holdings tenancies where you could have up to two successions with farmers there for, for three generations. Now, I think it'd be fair to say that this is a problem that is, is, is open, wide and widely identified. And to just give one example, uh, Henry Dimbleby in his national food strategy, uh, even though he's largely focusing on food, identified this as a major problem. If tenants don't have ready access to the environmental land management scheme, which is going to be the main form of farm support, then that is potentially uh, problematic. So again, moving on, if we look then at uh, potential difficulties uh, already evident in relation to the sustaining farming, sustainable farming incentive, which is the entry level component. Um, in general, that says that uh, agreements are to last for three years. And I think this was to me a bit of a surprise. This was fairly new, came out in December last year. The, it was annual payments under the CAP uh, for your basic payment scheme. Here, your general agreement is going to last for three years. This is, if this is your entry level component, and the average length of farm business tenancies is 3.4 years, that's going to put a lot of farmers under pressure, uh, whether they can participate. Actually, exceptionally for this year, if you've got between two and three years remaining, you can still participate. And DEFRA have said they will continue to work with tenant farmer representatives uh, before and after the scheme launches to make sure the scheme works for tenant farmers. But it, as I say, if you've got an average length of 3.4 years for farm business tenancies, it suggests that there's a considerable amount of work to, to do there. And the position is definitely exacerbated in the case of the other two uh, components of ELMS, local nature recovery and landscape recovery. As I say, SFI is entry level, so likely to be more short term. The landscape recovery, and this is recent uh, details that came out earlier this month, um, they say our expectation is that project implementation agreements will be long term, for example, 20 plus years, or well, 20 years plus. So that's not even in the same ballpark as, uh, as uh, farm business tenancies. You might have some, uh, and there's quite a lot left of the old agricultural holding tenants who could participate. But otherwise, uh, for farm business tenancies, that's nearly all of them, that's going to be unavailable. So um, the first problem for tenants is the, uh, the, the position as regards 
uh, length of tenancy. The second one, getting really into legal detail, is you could have a problem with covenants in a tenancy agreement. Your average farm tenancy will talk about using the land for agriculture. Now, what happens if you rewild your land? And this seems to be part emerging as part of landscape recovery. Now, having been for Many, many years ago, law in practice, this was the kind of thing we used to worry about was uh, definitions of agriculture. And what is clear is that the existing definitions focus on production. And that's whether it's the old Agricultural Holdings Act tenancies pre-1995 and thereafter your Agricultural Tenancies Act farm business tenancies uh, introduced uh, by that 1995 Act. Now, so just moving on to the next slide again, we've got there the definition of agriculture. It's the same for both. It's horticulture, fruit growing, seed growing, dairy farming. I won't go through the lot, um, but it's clearly about production. It will include woodlands, but they've got to be ancillary to the farming of the land for other agricultural purposes. So if you put trees on the lot, I think you've got a, 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 a potential argument with your landlord. So that isn't the end of the problem in terms of a breach of covenant, it, uh, an express covenant in a tenancy. Again, moving on to the next slide, what you can also have is potential problems with uh, the breach of the rules of good husbandry, which are set out in section 11 of the Agriculture Act uh, 19. 47. Now this uh, uh, says requires farmers uh, generally to comply with rules of good husband which include efficient production and failure to do so uh, can lead a landlord under the old Agricultural Holdings Act tenancies to serve what's called a case C notice to quit on the basis you're not complying with those rules. And I thought I'd just pause and go through quite slowly, this case called Cruz versus Snook 2017. It was a, uh, a, a, a case which related to a landlord, uh, sorry, a tenant, was a, which without landlord's consent entered their land into an environmental stewardship scheme. And they were found to be in breach. And I think two things to highlight. First of all, the absence of a crop was not uh, uh, in working well for the tenant when arguing for efficient production. So the absence of a crop puts the tenant at potential peril. And again, if we're thinking in terms of where Elms might be going, one of the things that the tribunal said was it is stretching the definitions too far to say that growing a mixture of grasses and flowers to attract pollinators was efficient production. You could argue that there was some sort of production and the pollinators would benefit production, but that was problematic. I think um, it's quite a harsh decision, that one. So again, moving on. So what's the position uh, as regards uh, the, the law at present? Uh, since uh, the new regime has been developed post-Brexit, no amendment has been affected to the statutory definition of agriculture. People have argued for it but it hasn't come through. Secondly, what they have done is that they put in place a procedure for Agricultural Holdings Act tenancies for where the landlord refuses consent for or a variation of terms when the tenant is trying to effectively unlock relevant financial assistance, which would include payments under ELMS. So the tenant says, I want to do this because I want my ELMS payment. The landlord says no, they can go uh, they can now, under the Agriculture Act 2020 amendment, they can now uh, challenge that. So again, moving on, we've now got detailed legislation on this, which is the Agricultural Holdings, really lengthy title, Request for Landlords Consent or Variation of Terms and Suitability Test England Regulations 2021. And there's also now guidance being issued or code of practice by uh, the Tenants Reform Industry industry Group. Perhaps just a comment on that. This is all fairly new, but just a comment, perhaps as a former practitioner, is definitely experience of the firm I worked with, tenants don't really like suing their landlords. 
uh, for obvious reasons. There's cost, but there's also you're not likely to have a chirpy and friendly landlord uh, on an ongoing basis. So I think there is a, reg a regime there, but whether it, how willing tenants are going to be to use it, I'm not, not sure uh, about that. Right, so in the, in the um, minutes left, if we could now move on to WTO implications, and I'm very conscious that Fiona Smith's in the room, and if there's any uh, really tricky questions, I will uh, uh, gladly pass them on to her. So thank you, Fiona. Um, so uh, what I will really consider in essence, the part of WTO law that's relevant here is, can Elms payments uh, secure exemption under the uh, WTO agreement on agriculture? And there's two main exemptions to look at. There's your green box, which is uh, fully exempt, and they're meant to be things that are um, it's basically so beneficial that they're in themselves that they're entitled to exemption. And then we'll have a look at that in a minute. And then there's a de minimis exemption, which is separate from the green box, which is when the level, the amount of money involved is so low, it shouldn't be trade distorting. Otherwise, it all falls into the amber box, which is trade distorting uh, uh, support and must be regulated. So looking first at the paragraph that everyone looks at for agri-environmental schemes, um, and this is paragraph 12 on the next slide of Annex, paragraph 12 of Annex 2, uh, payments under environmental programmes. I suspect lots of you will be familiar with this. It must be part of a clearly defined government programme. Notice it's going to be a government programme. So if you're in, if you're thinking about getting private uh, finance initiatives involved, just have a second thought about that and, uh, and, and whether, um, because that will probably um, not fall within the WTO at all, because um, it's only government supports producers that tends to be um, uh, caught. So it must be part of a clearly defined government environmental conservation program where there's conditions related to production in methods or inputs, which would seem to capture a lot of elms if you're, say, planting particular uh, beneficial crops, uh, etc. Now, the one that everyone refers to is the amount of payments shall be limited to the extra costs or loss of income involved. Notice, and this is something I'd really like to highlight, is that Often people talk about extra costs or loss uh, and loss of income. It's an either or, extra costs or loss of income. So, uh, moving again onto the next slide, we, this seems to have potential problems. It would seem to exclude incentive payments. And the EU industry has reformed its regime to remove incentive payments. So if you haven't got incentive payments, how are you going to get farmers to participate? Another potential uh, question is, does income forgone include opportunity costs? All the money that you might make from um, conventional agriculture. That's Alan Matthews discusses this, and, and he is absolutely brilliant um, on, on this area. The final one we'll just have a quick look at is that if, it's, if we are starting to look at, well, income forgone, then the greatest income forgone is probably going to be a intensive farmers down in the lowlands and that might not be the area where you're going to get the best environmental benefits you might be one the income for gone for a person trying to scratch a living up Swaledell may not be too large and therefore may not be a great in, in, um, enticement just quickly we'll have a look at two other um, potential exemptions under the green box um, one is general services and you'll be delighted to, uh, to see that research is, uh, particularly on, including on environmental schemes, is uh, green box compatible and exempt. Also includes training services and extension advisory services. And the way ELMS has been developed with a lot of focus on advisory and extension, that could be quite a large benefit. The other possibility under the green box are what no, it's a bespoke direct payment scheme. So you design your own direct payment scheme under paragraph five. But, and something Fiona's written on at great length, one of the criteria is that no production shall be required in order to receive payments under these bespoke schemes. 
So if you're obliging farmers to plant a certain crop or to um, include a particular type of livestock, then you're likely to be in problems. So that's the green box. Moving then on to the second exemption, which is the de minimis exemption under Article 64A. And this in the case of developed countries, I'll slightly paraphrase, it's basically 5% of the value of a particular crop or product, or if it's not directed towards a particular crop or product, which would probably be elms, then it's 5% of the total value of agricultural production. And Alan Matthews, who's an economist as well as knowing a huge amount of the law, has calculated that for the UK, these aren't bang up to date figures, slightly out of date, it would be quite a large sum. So it'd be uh, 1.155 uh, 1 uh, billion, so 1,155 uh, million pounds. So quite a lot potentially there. Finally, uh, the, uh, the last thing to mention is that if no exemption is available, then trade as uh, the Elms payments will fall in the amber box, which is trade distorting uh, uh, support and is subject to limitations. However, and this is a big however, uh, the limitations for the EU were quite large in that there's an upper limit based on um, historic uh, levels of support of 70 billion euros a year. And at the moment, the EU is nothing like hitting that limit. So there's a lot of headroom. But the problem is that following Brexit, that, uh, that needs to be divided. The, the entitlement is uh, in the name of the EU as opposed to the individual member states. And the, and the UK is trying to negotiate a share of that. My understanding is that no final agreement has been reached on that. But again, Fiona might be able to um, assist uh, on, on any updates. Finally, um, I want to say um, thank you, first of all, uh, to, to Graham for the generous introduction, many thanks. And then to, to Penny and Sarah, who've kept all the tech on the road and made my life easy. So I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. And also on the um, handout next to a holiday snap, actually, of Lot Lohman. So it's not part of England, not, not, not quite relevant in that regard uh, for Elms. But for the two projects where I've been working with um, uh, in, in interdisciplinary uh, product uh, projects with people from uh, Earth and Environment and Geography, which is, as I say, it's been a great pleasure to participate in that. One is CONSO, uh, Contractual Solutions for Effective and Lasting Delivery of Agri-Environment Climatic Public Goods by EU Agriculture, just did it in one breath, which is Horizon 2020 project, then a new project, which is Yorkshire uh, Landscape Recovery with DEFRA. So very many thanks uh, for, for your attention. I uh, hope that uh, assisted. Also, so I would be happy to talk about um, uh, results-based uh, schemes and potential legal difficulties if, if that is of assistance. Many thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael. I don't think anybody really uh, objects to see nice photos of Loch Lomond. <laughs> I'd be very surprised if they did. <laughs> um, I'm just going through the chat and there have been some questions, but some of the questions has sort of been answered uh, uh, by others. There was a question from uh, a guy, Ziv, who asked, would, he asked this question, would having no crop for one year you know, within a rotation be also in breach of that, uh, of that case, you know, Cruz versus Snook? Would having I, no crop for, for one year without rotation? I, I, I think and if you take it to its absolute logical extreme on the basis that absence of crop, um, uh, you, you, you would not you would not have you would not have a crop in the ground. I think, on the basis it would be part of a traditional four course rotation. You could argue because the key words were efficient production that a four course uh, rotation was efficient was efficient production. And the tribunal does to be a lot of the members do have perhaps a graphic expression, but they do have quite a lot of mud on their wellies. So I think that and they're quite grounded in. In, in, in agricultural practice. I, I, I would not, if I was advising a client, I'd, I'd say I don't think you need to fear too much on that. Now, technically, if you take the argument to its logical conclusion, 
um, it, it, I think you, you could argue that, well, well, there definitely isn't any production taking place. I just add on that, that they did look at a range of factors, and that was one factor, if that makes sense, rather than a critical and defining factor. I think, just to go on for just one more sentence on that, I think the thing that concerned me was the idea that growing crops for pollinators is potentially difficult. Um, that Because that, it, it just seems such a mismatch taking place with the aims of elms and the age of, ag of agri-environmental schemes and where the and where the agricultural holdings legislation is is at present. Hope that answers. Thank you. Okay, um, and another one from Harry Scott. Uh, it's just a quite a long question, so we'll, so bear with me as I go, read it out, Michael. Uh, he asked, with financial incentives coming in for elm schemes to supersede traditional incentive based on production, it sounds likely that non-agricultural organisations could buy up farmland as carbon offsetting projects as well as for financial gain. Is there anything likely to be done to regulate these schemes? I.e. Could, could a company like Tesla uh, bulk buy up land for carbon offsetting then just take the benefit from Elms without actually farming it? This is a really hot topic at the moment and at risk of going back straight off to tenancies where they're, they're, there's real concerns on behalf of tenants that they're, if landlords can see far more money from uh, a, a multinational coming in and, uh, uh, and, and using it for carbon offsets, it's a big incentive to remove um, either not renew farm business tenancies or in some cases um, if they can find a change of use of the land, then then um, there's, there's that again would be another possibility because change of use can justify what's called a case B uh, notice to quit. And uh, uh, there are genuine concerns. I think Ed Sheeran's uh, is carbon offsetting his uh, uh, his travel at the moment, and the thing that comes to mind. I don't know. There won't be many of you old enough to remember this, but there was the famous uh, woodlands up in Scot uh, Sutherland, up in Scotland, when celebrities and famously Terry Wogan, uh, was, were, they were buying up the flow country and planting huge amounts of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of trees up there. I think what, what the kind of thing you may need to be, might assist is you will have to look at planning law. There might be limitations on there. And then there's also, um, uh, there's, there's, uh, I think there's wider food security ob objections that, that could be uh, articulated, but they're not at the moment translated into law. If a person wants to buy land, as long as they're within existing planning uses, um, then they, that they propose or they get planning permission, then they've, they've pretty much got a, a clear run at it. And they've also got far more resources. I think overall, to put it in a nutshell, there's a real sense that the financial resources of the, agri of the traditional farmer, they're struggling often because of people having inheritance tax advantages in buying farmland and now for rewilding and other projects. And I think they feel that they, you know, they don't have the resources to compete with those deep pockets. So I say planning law might, might assist. And also in some cases, you may need environmental impact assessments for uh, uh, certain projects. And that's specified in the environmental impact assessment legislation. Thank you. There have been a, a few comments actually about, about this offsetting. Um, comments rather than questions, which you could perhaps uh, remark on um, from Pippa Chapman saying about land for current offsetting is a, is a potential big issue. And Wales is very aware this is happening. Yes. Uh, the percentage of land producing food is very likely to decrease as a result of elms. And uh, um, uh, Tony something says, main large corporations are snapping up land in Wales and planting 80% non-endemic species and gulping up all the subsidies. So it does need regulating. Yeah, I think there's also there's some, some really excellent research that came up out of Oxford a while ago about the extent to which if we are taking so much of our good agricultural land out of production, by definition, we're likely to be having to import land, import uh, food and products from overseas. And if they're actually chopping down rainforest 
to get the extra land for those imports, then overall we might be uh, in, in uh, a, net, a net loss, a net uh, disadvantage. So I think there is a, is a, there's, there's a real threat that we, we've, like so much heavy industry has been done in the past, we're going to export the problem. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, there are a couple of others um, as well. Um, one from um, Claire James, I believe there has been criticism of the speed of rollout and also impact assessments. Has the government considered the impact of these provisions on food security in the UK, especially in terms of possible reduction in production if farmers go out of business? And then sort of Holly Jones follows up saying, you know, that um, that food does need, need to be produced sustainably, but not at the risk of loss of UK production and just yeah. a lot on imports. So I put those, those sort of two together there. I think there's actually that's a the, the first one's a very timely question because we've just had um, under the Agriculture Act and the various led and the, the new regulatory framework, there's an obligation to have food security reports and we've just had our food first food security report i don't know whether fiona wants to comment on this but i think it'd be fair to say they were fairly sanguine about that that's um that food security was that was not it deeply imperiled with again an emphasis on on imports and we're also um in, in introducing you know with these trade deals we're getting with australia and new zealand we've um although there's a bit of delay on fully opening the door. It looks definitely to me that within a few years, Australia and New Zealand have got pretty much open access to our market. So it, it looked, as I say, it, it, it looks like the government's focusing on imports and going for um, in, environmental uh, criteria within, within the UK. As regards to second question is, a thought on that is that it again going back a, a fair while there was the old idea of multifunctional agriculture which, which has become a bit less popular uh, in, in, in the in discourse at least but very much the idea that you try to grow your food production while at the same time looking after your environment your animal welfare and similar and uh, it does seem I think there's a definitely a, quite a strong lobbies for the idea that we should manage to keep our food production as was rightly said in the second question in a sustainable way um, uh, and, and this in some ways is is the multifunctional model um, perhaps just one further comment on that because one there's been a lot of talk about going for sustainable intensification and it's uh, which has been often equated with putting in large amounts of intensive agriculture to focus on intensification but the first word should also have weight um, it should be sustainable as well so it that does seem to me to have merit but it seems to have got mixed up uh, with a, with uh, levels of hostility towards intensive agriculture so I hope that again assists okay thank you uh, thank you for that um, and there's another question I think I saw uh, from uh, Guys, if there's discussion of blended finance, namely combining elements with money from, from the private sector, um, so you know, uh, so your blended finance, uh, yes. any thoughts of the WTA implications of such blended schemes? For, or trade God, or oh gosh, that's a, <laughs> that, that's definitely set the, the grey cells buzzing. It's but we understand again, Fiona, if, if I get this wrong, just uh, pop in and keep me right. My understanding is if you're looking at the main exemption for, for environmental payments under paragraph 12 of Annex 2 to the Agreements on Agriculture, it refers to a government funded uh, conservation programme. I'll just flick up so I've got the words in front of me. Clearly defined government environmental conservation programme. The question is, uh, whereas if you, if you have something that's purely private finance, that doesn't fall within uh, world trade rules. Like the, an off the cuff thought is presumably say you've got 10 million coming from the government, 10 million coming from uh, a private sector instinct would be that 10 million counts towards uh, your, uh, 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 your world trade uh, uh, 
legislation, it will be covered by the legislation and hopefully get exemption. Being a lawyer, it could, would you then say that if a scheme is part government, part private, does it then qualify as a clearly defined government environmental or conservation uh, programme? But then it must be part of a clearly defined program. So I think I think the answer to that is um, I could see lawyers having a hay down that. But in, instinct to me would suggest that you should be able to split it. Logic would dictate it because the, what's the mischief the legislation's against? I think it's it's against levels of government support distorting trade. Um, just a final thought on that though: that if you've got the finance coming from the private sector and you put the government um, money on top that actually gives it extra leverage the government money has sort of almost double worth in a sense um because it's 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 going to be far more likely that there'll be participation because of those twin elements so I've, i think i've given a lawyer's answer there i've gone around the block a few times and come up with something that's not particularly clear but i haven't charged a fee okay um it's about 12.40 now, um, so uh, there seem to be no more questions, but some interesting uh, sort of comments I saw in the chat and one or two nice sort of links, uh, to hyperlinks for people to look at more information in certain areas, which uh, uh, um, is very helpful. Um, well, it not being face to face, well, if it were face to face, we'd all be giving you a nice hearty round of applause, uh, Michael. Uh, unfortunately, we, we, we can't really do that, but I'm sure uh, everybody has been attended has found it very enlightening uh, and in their, in their own minds it is giving you a good clap. Um, so on behalf of everybody, I'd like to say thanks so much. I mean, I've learned a lot uh, from, your, from your excellent talk, as I'm sure everyone else, and it's been a very nice interaction. I look at the chat, I see you provoked a lot of not just questions, but a lot of interaction and people answering each other's questions, uh, which I think is quite uh, is quite a nice thing to see. So, uh, so thank you very much, Michael. I uh, look forward to uh, catching up with you soon, uh, which we haven't done for a very long time uh, face to face, uh, as I'm sure we all uh, would like to uh, get together uh, and talk about global food and environment all together. Uh, this is the least, uh, uh, this is you know, the second best thing, uh, but at least we got the first best person to talk. Uh, so thank you, Michael, and I wish everybody else uh, uh, you know, a good day. And, uh, and thanks also to the Institute for Inviting Me uh, to play a, a modest role in this event as well. So uh, thanks all and uh, take care, all right. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Right. So, bye, everybody. Bye.